Our introduction to capillarity is divided into two lectures. The first lecture will introduce the young Laplace equation, the concept of curvature, and demonstrate its qualitative and quantitative determination for a sphere. We will also develop the equations describing both static and dynamic capillary rise for idealized spherical surfaces and interfaces. We begin with a qualitative description for the origin of capillary pressure. For this, consider a border separating emissible phases I and J, and focus on a small representative volume or surface element isolated using imaginary boundaries. This element is under tension from the surrounding interface. As discussed, surface tension forces act in plane and perpendicular to wetting and imaginary cutting lines. Let's further stipulate that the element is part of a curved surface or interface, possibly resulting from wetting phenomenon or the formation of particles. We use the term curvature here, often indicated with kappa, to describe the extent to which a surface deviates from a plane. Higher curvature or higher kappa indicates greater deviation or a more sharply curved interface. It can be seen that as the element is curved, a portion of the tension force pulls the element back against phase I on the concave side of the curved surface. This results in a portion of the force from the surface tension acting over the projected area of the element to counter the hydrostatic pressure. As a result, the pressure on the concave side of the interface must be higher than that on the convex side to maintain equilibrium. This counterpressure, due to the surface tension, is known as capillary pressure, denoted here as delta P subscript C. Thus, capillary pressure quantifies a pressure gradient across a surface or interface which is positive, high to low, from the concave side to the convex side. From this initial description of capillary pressure, it should not be surprising that it is directly related to film tension and curvature through what is known as the young laplace equation. The surface or interfacial tension determines the extent of the forces placed on the element by the surrounding interface, and the curvature determines the extent to which this force acts to counter fluid pressure on the concave side of the film. For a fixed curvature, raising tension increases the magnitude of the resulting force countering the pressure. For a fixed interfacial tension, increasing curvature increases the force per unit area countering the hydrostatic pressure. The capillary pressure is dependent on surface or interfacial tension and curvature. By now, we are quite familiar with the former, but the latter, curvature, may be a new concept for some of you. Curvature values at a point are the inverses of the radii of curvature, which are the radii of two orthogonally oriented circles that fit the surface at that point. Here we demonstrate schematically how to identify these quantities on the surface of a pendant drop. First, a unit normal vector is placed at the point of interest, P, on the drop surface. This defines a tangent plane at P, shown in red here. Unless otherwise indicated, we will place normal vectors on the outside of the shapes under consideration. For simple shapes, this will typically be on the convex side, which produces positive curvature values. Next, we need to find two orthogonal circles which are tangent to the drop surface at point P. The first radius of curvature can be found by passing a perpendicular plane through the surface which contains the unit normal. The choice of how the first plane is oriented is arbitrary, but by choosing a plane that is vertical such that it includes the axis of symmetry for the drop helps facilitate our discussion. The intersection between the surface and the plane produces a curve around point P. The radius for a circle that fits into this curve is defined as the radius of curvature for the vertical plane. Here, the normal vector is attached to the outside of the circle pointing away from it. In other words, the circle is contained within the drop shape. This will be considered a positive radius. Using this convention, if the normal is inside the circle and pointing towards its center, that is the circle is not contained within the shape, the radius value would be considered negative. A second radius of curvature is found by repeating the process just described but for a plane that is perpendicular to the first. The radius for a circle that fits into the curve of intersection for this plane is defined as the radius of curvature for the horizontal plane. This value is also positive. To review the determination of the radii of curvature, especially the sign convention, let's consider a slightly more complex surface. We can do this by simply moving the point of interest up the drop surface to its neck 
where the concavity changes. Again, we can find the radius of curvature values for the vertical and horizontal planes. Here are the magnitudes for the radii of curvature. For the vertical plane, the circle is outside the drop. That is, the normal is attached to the inside of the circle and points towards the center. Thus, this value is negative. For the horizontal plane, the normal is attached outside of the circle and points away from it. That is, the circle is contained within the drop. Thus, this value is positive. This example not only reviews the sign convention, but also makes the point that radii of curvature often vary over a body and can even become negative in certain regions, even when the practice of placing the normal on the outside of the shape is used. Before moving on to a more quantitative determination of these values, we review the approach demonstrated schematically and show how to use the radii of curvature to calculate what we're actually after, the curvature values. Curvature values measure how sharply a surface is curved, and they are defined simply as the inverses of the radius of curvature values. These curvatures found here are the principal values, that is the maximum and minimum values for point P. This is the case because the initial cutting plane is aligned with the axis of symmetry for the drop. It is common practice to assign one to the maximum principal curvature value and two to the minimum although this is an unnecessary formality for our purposes. The nice thing about gauging curvatures using orthogonal planes is that the sum of these values, whether they are the principal values or not, is an invariant. That is, as long as the planes used to determine the curvatures at P are perpendicular to the tangent plane defined by the normal and include the normal, their sum is a constant. One last point to make is that the cap of values in the young Laplace equation is actually the sum of the curvature values for two orthogonal cutting planes, the invariant described above. This value is sometimes referred to as the total curvature. In capillary studies, we're often examining shapes that possess a centrally located rotational axis of symmetry. Such shapes can be represented with two-dimensional images, such as the shadow images collected in optical sessile and pendant drop experiments. With the understanding that the entire shape is obtained through its rotation about the axis of symmetry, typically designated as the z-axis, such shapes will be the focus of our discussion. To quantitatively gauge curvature values for the two-dimensional representation of the pendant drop, we place the x-axis under the drop apex, and the positive z-axis, the axis of rotational symmetry, is passed through the center of the drop image. Due to the symmetry, analysis of half the drop provides curvature values over the entire surface. As before, we will determine two curvature values for an arbitrarily chosen point P. Again, the normal is placed on the outside of the shape. The first value to be determined is that for the local vertical plane at P. With our two-dimensional image, this is now a matter of calculating the curvature for a plane curve. For this, we must also provide the unit tangent because the curvature for a plane curve is defined as the rate at which the direction of the tangent changes as we move along the arc length or outline of the image. It can be shown that this is simply equal to the rate of change of the angle phi. That is, curvature is equal to the rate of change in phi with respect to arc length, d phi ds. It should be emphasized that phi is measured from the x-axis and increases positively in the counterclockwise direction. We will explain the need for the plus-minus symbol here shortly. The second local curvature value for a point is determined from the rotational symmetry of the shape. The value would be obtained by passing a plane directly into the image perpendicular to the screen that also passes through the unit normal. This would be the resulting radius of curvature for such a plane. This can be concluded from the required orientation and the rotational symmetry which requires that it originate from the axis of symmetry, the z-axis. By inspection, it is apparent that this angle is phi, and this line segment is the distance to p along the x-axis. Thus, the curvature for the horizontal plane is calculated as the sine of phi divided by x, which, based on the placement of the unit tangent, should always be positive. Now, what about the plus-minus symbol? This is required because we are free to place the unit normal inside or outside the shape. It's not calculated. With it outside the shape, we would take the values as determined, which could include some negative values. If we move the normal inside the shape, oriented towards its center, we would multiply the determined values by negative one. Finally, if we have a function that fits the outline of the image, often this is a local empirical fit surrounding the point of interest, the curvature values at a point can be determined using the following relationships where the final expression contains both local curvatures when expanded. And here I'm summarizing all of these results. 
To reinforce the discussion of the previous few slides, let's now apply these approaches to a basic shape, a sphere with a radius r. The resulting curvature for spherical surfaces and interfaces is found to be 2 over r. Examples where surfaces and interfaces can be approximated as being spherical include particles and emulsions, the meniscus that tops a liquid column in a uh, cylindrical capillary tube, bubbles, and even sessile drops. In reality, the influence of gravity will tend to cause these surfaces and interfaces to vary, sometimes significantly, from the spherical approximation. However, this approach is still quite useful in teaching capillary concepts. So let's begin with a schematic description for finding curvature values for a spherical shape. The first step is to identify the point of interest P and place our unit normal there, which defines the tangent plane. As you may have already noticed, for a sphere, our choice does not matter. The curvature is the same at all points on the surface, but we choose an arbitrary point. A vertical plane is passed through the normal and cuts into the surface to produce a curve of intersection. The radius of the circle that best fits the curve at point P is taken as a radius of curvature for the vertical plane. It should again be emphasized that the choice of the first plane is not unique. The only restriction is that it must be perpendicular to the tangent plane and cut through the unit normal at the selected point. However, in practice, the planes consistent with the symmetry will produce the principal curvatures. The unit normal points to the outside of the determined circle, so the radius is positive. By rotating the vertical plane 90 degrees and following the same procedure, the radius of curvature for the horizontal plane is identified, which is also positive. Both values are equal to the radius of the sphere, and their inverses provide equal curvature terms, kappa 1 and kappa 2, which when summed is equal to the total curvature. If the normal is flipped and the same procedure is followed, a negative total curvature results. Now let's develop the expression from the equations introduced earlier. This begins by collapsing the sphere into its two-dimensional representation, which is a circle. As discussed, the x-axis is placed directly underneath the shape, but it could also be placed directly over it. The symmetry, or z-axis, then bisects the shape. Because the curvature is the same over the entire surface, we will just consider the first quadrant. The radius r for the circle is also the radius for the sphere. For consistency, let's identify a point of interest and place the unit normal on the outside of the circle. The equation for the shape in this region is as follows. The first and second order derivatives of the function are then found. These are shown here. Plugging these into the curvature equations, both result in a value of 1 over the radius r. And their sum, the total curvature, is equal to 2 over the radius r. Having shown how to determine the curvature for a spherical surface, we return to the Young-Laplace equation. Consider a spherical liquid droplet of radius r, this is our phase i, submerged in a continuous phase, phase j, which can be another liquid or a vapor. As discussed, we expect the phase on the concave side of the interface inside the particle to have a higher pressure than the phase on the convex side surrounding the particle. Bisecting the sphere, which is in mechanical equilibrium, with an imaginary cutting plane allows us to isolate a hemisphere composed of the interface and pressurized fluid contained within. Acting on this free body are the tension forces and the interface and the fluid pressure. The horizontal equation for the equilibrium includes the resultant from the tension, which is the surface tension multiplied by the perimeter of the free body L. This is balanced by the pressure force which is the pressure difference across the interface multiplied by the area of the circular plane. Previously, we defined the pressure gradient that exists across a curved interface as a capillary pressure. With this substitution, the equilibrium equation can be rearranged to the Young-Laplace equation for a spherical surface or interface, where the curvature is given as 2 divided by the radius of the sphere. This equation applies not only to a full spherical particle, but also any portion of a surface or interface that is assumed to have a spherical shape. Here, a classic example for spherical surfaces in the Young-Laplace equation is reviewed. We have two soap bubbles attached to each other through a tube. A valve located in the middle of the tube is closed. The pressures on either side of the valve are different, so once the valve is opened, air will move resulting in the growth of one bubble and the shrinkage of the other. The question asks you to determine which way the air will move once the valve is opened. We begin by assuming that the shapes 
of both bubbles can be modeled as spheres. The bubble on the left, bubble A, has a larger radius than the bubble on the right, bubble B. The pressure differences across the bubble surfaces are their capillary pressures, and it is shown that the difference in internal pressures between the bubbles is equal to the difference in their capillary pressures. The capillary pressures are calculated from the young laplace equation for spherical surfaces and interfaces. The factor of 4 is used rather than 2 because the bubbles possess both internal and external surfaces. The equation indicates that bubble B, the smaller bubble, initially has a higher pressure than bubble A, the larger bubble. So the air will move from bubble B into bubble A. Theoretically, the movement of air would continue until both bubbles possess the same radius. A useful application of the young laplace equation for spherical surfaces and interfaces is in the measurement of dynamic surface tension with a method known as maximum bubble pressure. Such measurements are made with a bubble pressure tensiometer. The technique monitors the pressure required to produce inert gas bubbles in a test liquid at a constant rate through a capillary tube of a known radius. The difference between the pressure inside the tube required to maintain a constant gas flow and the pressure outside the tube, which includes atmospheric pressure plus the liquid column, is the capillary pressure. Assuming the bubbles have a spherical shape, we can apply the young laplace equation to obtain a relationship between surface tension and monitored pressure. The reason the technique is called the maximum bubble pressure method is that the pressure changes as the bubble forms. Here's a schematic showing the expected pressure curve as a function of bubble development. Let's follow the bubble formation process through. As the bubble first forms at the tip, its radius is large, and the measured pressure is close to the external pressure. When the bubble reaches the tip of the capillary tube, its radius starts to decrease. As the bubble is pushed out at the end of the capillary tube, it shrinks steadily and the pressure increases. The minimum radius and thus the maximum pressure is reached when the bubble forms a hemisphere at the end of the tube. As the bubble is expelled further, its radius again starts to increase and the pressure drops until finally the bubble is expelled. From this curve, which is repeated with a tunable frequency, the surface tension of a solution can be determined from its maximum corresponding to the minimum spherical radius, that is, the radius of the capillary tube. Assuming the liquid wets the tube surface, the internal tube radius is usually used in calculations. The advantage of the maximum bubble pressure technique is in its speed and convenience, as well as its dynamic aspect, that is, the tunable bubble frequency, which provides for an examination of surface diffusion rates of surfactants and other components such as contaminants. Furthermore, robust versions of the test equipment are available, allowing for continuous measurements in industrial operations where large quantities of liquids, liquids that may be too difficult or too dangerous to sample, can be monitored. A major difficulty with the technique is accuracy. For extremely small bubbles, the spherical approximation may be accurate. But under most circumstances, we must account for gravitational effects, buoyancy, on the surface curvature. This correction will be discussed in the next lecture. Let's turn now to the topic of capillary rise. When a cylindrical capillary tube is placed into a liquid, the liquid contained within the tube will typically either rise to a level above the liquid surrounding the tube or fall below it. Whether the liquid rises or falls and the extent of this behavior is explained with the young laplace equation. Our underlying assumption is that the meniscus that forms inside the capillary tube is a spherical surface. Consider a capillary tube with an inside radius r. If the liquid has a contact angle of less than 90 degrees on the tube surface, the meniscus is curved upwards, resulting in capillary rise. This rise is due to the capillary pressure across the spherical surface, estimated with the young laplace equation, where capital R is the radius of the curvature for the spherical surface, not the capillary tube. This quantity is difficult to determine, but is related to the tube radius through the cosine of the contact angle. Making this substitution in the young laplace equation provides an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure across the surface. Now we move in the other direction and consider a liquid that forms a contact angle on the walls of the tube of greater than 90 degrees. 
This produces a spherical meniscus that is curved in the downwards direction, resulting in capillary depression or fall. Again, a relationship can be found between the radius of the curvature for the meniscus and the tube radius, which is subtly different from that for capillary rise. Its substitution in the young Laplace equation provides an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure. Before reviewing how to solve classic capillary rise problems, let's consider an interesting phenomenon. You may have noticed, maybe while cleaning a pipette in chem lab, that drops or short columns of water often collect that are difficult to shake out. Here we consider such a scenario in which a short column of water is trapped in a 3 millimeter cylindrical tube. The question provides the receding angle located at the top of the column and the advancing angle located at the bottom of the column and asks for the column length. To solve this problem, we simply add up all the pressure contributions at both surfaces. This demonstrates the advantage of calculating the magnitude of the capillary pressures and then adding or subtracting their contributions based on the context of the application. From the top of the drop moving down, we have the atmospheric pressure pushing down and the capillary pressure countering this. That is, we subtract the magnitude for a contact angle of less than 90 degrees using the receding angle. Moving down, we have the liquid column of length L pressing down on the second surface and the capillary pressure that adds to this. That is, we add the magnitude of the capillary pressure for the advancing angle. Finally, the atmospheric pressure is pushing up on the bottom of the column. These contributions have to all add up to zero. From here, we solve for L and plug in the numbers. A point that should be made here regarding contact angle values. Unless otherwise stated, as is done here for example, it should be assumed that all contact angles are the young or ideal values. Here we are considering capillary rise, but this time we want to find a relationship between meniscus height, the capillary radius, liquid surface tension, and the contact angle for the liquid on the tube surface. Capillary height is gauged from the surface of the outside liquid along the vertical z-axis and is measured from the bottom of the meniscus for reasons discussed in the next lecture. We begin by finding a pair of points at the same vertical height, in this case z equals zero, where the pressures are equal. Point A outside the capillary tube where the pressures denoted P subscript A and point B inside the tube where the pressures denoted P subscript B. At point A, the pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure at height Z plus the density of the gas multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity and Z. At point B, we have the atmospheric pressure at Z plus the density of the liquid multiplied by GZ. And we subtract off the magnitude of the capillary pressure because the meniscus is concave up. You could say countering the atmospheric pressure. We substitute in the expression developed earlier for the magnitude of the capillary pressure for a contact angle of less than 90 degrees and solve for Z. Now let's apply the same approach to find the relationship between meniscus fall, capillary radius, liquid surface tension, and the contact angle for the liquid on the tube surface. Again, the vertical or z-axis with its origin defined at the surface of the liquid outside the tube is used to gauge the location of the bottom of the meniscus. With capillary fall, this value will be negative. Points at the same vertical height, in this case negative z, where the pressures are equal, are identified. Point A, outside the capillary tube, where the pressures denoted P subscript A, and point B inside the tube where the pressure is denoted P subscript B. At point A, the pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure at the liquid surface plus the density of the liquid multiplied by G negative Z. At point B, we have the atmospheric pressure at the surface plus the density of the gas multiplied by G negative Z. And here, we add the magnitude of the capillary pressure because of the meniscus is concave down. You could say adding to the atmospheric pressure. We substitute in the expression developed earlier for the magnitude of the capillary pressure for contact angle greater than 90 degrees and solve for Z, which is identical to the equation developed for capillary rise. This equation is known as Durant's Law. 
It is convenient because a single expression accounts for both capillary rise and fall. The second form of Jurand's law is provided in terms of the capillary length, which gauges the relative strength of the surface tension forces versus the gravitational forces. The value is a relative length scale beyond which gravity will have a significant influence on the system. So far, we've only considered equilibrium conditions, but next we briefly discuss modeling the rate at which liquid moves through cylindrical capillaries. The hagen poiseuille equation relates the pressure change across the cylindrical capillary tube to the laminar volumetric flow rate through the viscosity of the liquid, tube length, and its internal radius. This can be rewritten in terms of liquid velocity using the cross-sectional area of the tube. Finally, here we show a more general form of the equation, which allows for the variation in pressure change across the tube. For this system, a cylindrical capillary tube of internal radius r is placed horizontally into a liquid bath. The liquid has a contact angle of theta on the tube surface. The x-axis measures the distance the liquid moves through the tube. We apply the hagen poiseuille equation for which delta p is measured as the difference in pressure acting at the ends of the tube. At point A located at the tube entrance, the pressure p subscript a accounts for all contributions to pressure in the bath at that depth. For example, atmospheric pressure, liquid weight, even pressurization. At point B, the tube is open to the atmosphere, so P subscript B is the atmospheric pressure. The difference in pressure between points A and B is defined as the change in external pressure across the tube. Assuming the contact angle is less than 90 degrees, to this we add the magnitude of the capillary pressure and substitute it in for the pressure gradient in the hagen poiseuille equation. This pressure gradient is constant across the tube. The equation can be rearranged to provide an estimate of the rate at which the liquid moves down the tube, an equation known as the Lucas-Washburn equation. Solving this differential equation provides a relationship between the penetration distance and time. This equation also applies to the movement of meniscus in the opposite direction to counter the external gradient. For this example, the Lucas-Washburn equation is applied to model the movement of liquid into a waterproofed fabric. It is assumed that the pores are cylindrical with an average diameter of 25 microns. The question asks what pressure gradient has to be applied to move the water into the fabric. To estimate this, we set the penetration rate equal to zero and solve for the external pressure gradient. The equation shows that the pressure required is independent of the liquid viscosity and increases with surface tension and the contact angle beyond 90 degrees. Obviously, if the angle were less than 90 degrees, the capillary pressure would enhance flow into the pores. The result found after plugging in the numbers indicates that only a nominal pressure is required to overcome the barrier exerted by the capillary pressure. Although its effectiveness is limited, waterproofing does inhibit pore flow to a certain extent, and in many products such as paper, waterproofing has the additional benefit of maintaining strength by inhibiting flow into quite small spaces that exist between bonded surfaces. Here we look at the same system, except this time the capillary tube is oriented vertically. This is a capillary rise system discussed previously for which a relationship was found between the height of the meniscus, capillary radius, liquid surface tension, and the contact angle for the liquid on the tube surface. However, rather than modeling the equilibrium position of the meniscus, here we examine the kinetics of the rise process. Capillary height is again gauged from the surface of the outside liquid along the vertical z-axis and measured from the bottom of the meniscus. To model the kinetics of this process, the starting point is the hagen poiseuille equation. The external pressure is defined as the difference in pressures at the tube entrances, points A and B, which is equal to negative delta rho GZ. To this, we add the magnitude of the capillary pressures for a contact angle less than 90 degrees. Plugging into the hagen poiseuille equation, we obtain the Lucas-Washburn expression. This time, it's slightly more complicated in that the external pressure increases with height, z. To solve the differential equation, we first collect and combine constants to obtain a simpler form of the integral. Integrating from 0 to t, corresponding to a climb from 0 to z, we obtain this. The result is not a simple function, but we can check the extremes. As t heads towards 0, so does z. 
Also, as t heads to infinity, z heads towards the result we found earlier for the equilibrium height of the meniscus for capillary rise. Thus, the equation indicates that the meniscus starts at the same level as the liquid outside the tube and climbs until the pressure from the weight of the liquid column balances the capillary pressure. Let's finish up with an example which uses this equation. We are asked to determine the time required for the meniscus to climb to half its equilibrium height. All the information required to calculate values for the constants A and B are provided. It's again assumed that the vapor density can be neglected relative to the density of the liquid. As was just shown, the equilibrium height of the column is equal to negative B over A. This value is multiplied by one half and entered into the equation along with the values for the constants to provide an estimate for the time required, which is quite small. This completes lecture one of our chapter on capillarity.